I'll just go through a very quick introduction about myself and um, and then I'll chat a bit about Fleur de Cup and, and how we, uh, yeah, just our history and what, what I want you to know about Fleur de Cup. So let's start with myself. Um, obviously born and raised in, uh, in the Western Cape, uh, especially Tilbach, small town about 60, 70 kilometers from, from Stellenbosch uh, or 80 kilometers from, from um, Cape Town. Uh, Surrounded by wine farms, my, no, my parents did not own a wine farm, but I, uh, some of my friends actually did. So I was introduced to the wine industry at a very young age. I got to taste um, some fermenting juice. We weren't allowed to drink the wine, but we obviously uh, snuck into the cellars and drank some, uh, some fermenting juice. So um, just the, the fact that a yeast cell, I mean, a yeast cell is about this small and it can take um, grape juice and turn it into wine and alcohol that absolutely fascinated me um, and just the, the the idea of making wines and taking or, or putting something on the table that you can um, that you can show people really fascinated me so i went to study winemaking at the Stellum, uh, Stellenbosch university uh 2000 sorry 1999 to 2003 um, and I was very fortunate to, to start, um, start my career at Niederberg um, as an assistant winemaker. Uh, just an interesting story, and you, hopefully you will get the, the, uh, the pun behind it. But um, I, start, yeah, I started as, as, um, yeah, sorry, at Niederberg, and then in 2007, I moved on to Fleur de Cap. Uh, beginning of 2007 and just a quick story there is the fact that I was uh, responsible for all the white wines on Fleur de Cup. So what happened is I, uh, my email signature at the bottom, I said uh, Peter Barnos, white wine maker Fleur de Cup. And one of my friends uh, replied to, to that mail and he says, how dare you call yourself a white wine maker given South Africa's political background? So I realized, okay, so I stopped calling myself a white wine maker. I'm a maker of white wines. You should be very careful about your wording there. But I was very fortunate to move over from the whites to the reds um, in 2015. And then um, since 2017, um, I'm basically responsible for both the whites and the reds as the, as the head wine maker for, for both, um, for all the Fleur de Cup wines. Uh, just a bit more on my background. Um, I met my wife in my third year at university um, in 2000 and uh, what is it, 2003. Uh, we got married in 2000 and um, sorry, no, 2001. We 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 met uh, married in 2004. We've got two kids: a boy born in 2007, a little daughter born in 2011. Um, so yeah, uh, that's 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 basically me, and um, I I'm extremely passionate about wine and the whole industry and the fact that, um, like I said, something that I have in hand in and, and, and something that I can create uh, gets to travel the world and somewhere in probably more than eighty countries where we sell Fleur de Cup. Somebody's sitting, opening a bottle of Fleur de Cup now, enjoying something that I made. And it, it just fascinates me that they get to drink that wine and enjoy it with friends and around the table with, with, uh, with good food and everything. And that, that's just, it's a beautiful story about how wine can travel and cross borders. So um, I, I, that really fuels me. So just... Um, to, to sort of go back a bit, my philosophy as a winemaker is always to, uh, to create during harvest season that we've just gone through is I try and create building blocks because for Fleur de Cup, we are in a very fortunate position to buy grapes from different areas. So we will go to Darling, uh, Marmesbury, um, obviously in and around Paul, in and around Stellenbosch, um, going all the way to, uh, through Elgin, down to uh, Cape of Gallas, uh, Robertson, Franz Hook, Sierras, uh, all these different areas. And we buy grapes from all of them. 
a lot of farms in and around those towns and everything. And we, we bring those lots into the cellar and we keep them separate. So we ferment them, we make the wines, uh, we put some of them that goes to barrels, some of it's tank based. And then um, those building blocks we can use to, to make the wines and to taste those different building blocks and decide we want to use a bit of this, a bit of that, put it together and that is the eventual Fleur de Cup Sauvignon Blanc or Fleur de Cup Merlot, whatever we're busy with working. So during harvest season, I just want to make a lot of different building blocks, different, um, like I said, different, uh, use different yeasts that, that creates different attributes on the wine. You get some yeast that, that might enhance the, the tropical flavors on a Sauvignon Blanc. You get some yeasts that, that really uh, bring to the forefront your, your more greener notes, maybe on a Sauvignon Blanc. So um, by using those different blocks from, from different areas, it already different, uh, gives you different building blocks. And then you might split one of those blocks into two parcels and use different yeasts to again gives you give you uh, different uh, components uh, you keep all of them separate and and then that becomes your building blocks that becomes your tools and your playing that you can play with that we can use um, this time of year when we, it's a, I won't say it's a, it's a lot more quiet but we've got a bit more time to go and taste through them again and again and again and then say okay that, um, that tank of Sauvignon Blanc that came from Darling, um, that's the best tank we have in the cellar. Let's add about, uh, well, uh, let's add a bit more of um, uh, the, the tank that we, use, that we fermented with another yeast. And that, that gives you, that's, that's the winning blend. That's, a, that's what we want to put in bottle. So that we can now start uh, clean, blending together. In the, in the cellar, obviously we, it started off as a, as a um, you go into the laboratory, you draw the different components and you play with percentages and you make up different blends um, and, you, and you pick a winning blend. Then you go to the cellar and you, you actually blend that uh, in, in, uh, in, the, in the same proportions as you had in the laboratory scale. And now we can clean up the wine by um, uh, with a bit of fining, you set, set uh, especially on the, and I'll talk about the unfiltered range now, but um, you settle to the bottom, you get the clean wine off, and that's what you bottle. So um, I'm talking a lot, I'm talking fast, but I just want to get it clear that the fact that I have the privilege of working with a lot of building blocks um, from different areas, and not all sellers, and there's very little sellers in, in South Africa that has that that amount of scope and that amount of play from, from, from getting grapes from different regions to the, to the extent that we at Fleur Cup do. So I'm in a very fortunate position, love my job and the fact that I get to obviously also travel to, to those different areas because during harvest season I will literally go to Darling, go to Stellenbosch, go to um, all these different farms, taste the grapes as they are busy ripening, um, and decide on a picking date. So um, it's 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 I, I absolutely love love that that part of my job is being both in the vineyards tasting grapes and then coming back to the cellar, um, seeing those grapes come to the, to to the cellar and making those building blocks, then tasting them at, when they're done and then putting them together to put in bottle. I said a heck of a lot. Can I? I'm going to stop now. Is there any questions? I, I before I go on, is there thank any? Thank you. Um, first, I just want to say thank you for for talking to us this morning. And I actually just heard about. Uh, I heard you saying something about um, talking about numbers, as in like from from when you have to harvest and things like that, as in when you take everything to the lab to to to. Just wanted to confirm actually if you are guided by numbers by those numbers or you just work with the grape or if you are cut by those those uh, numbers that you you get from the lab oh yeah um okay so you, you want to know how do i decide when to harvest oh yeah, well, yeah if i say yeah sorry for me the word laboratory uh, doing a laboratory uh, blending is it's not the analysis uh, part of the knowledge uh, we, we just talk about uh, we have a little tasting room call it a tasting room 
where we make up uh, blends. So it's purely um, getting the different tanks and then saying, well, let's use 50% of this tank one, 50%, uh, sorry, and 25% of tank two and 25% of tank three, making that up in, a, in, a, in, a, in like 500 mils of 500 milliliters of that, of each of those blends and then tasting the, the, um, those building of the, those different blends. So we call it a laboratory uh, scale winemaking. It's it's uh, with measuring cylinders and everything, and and um, that that for me is the laboratory winemaking part. So it's not it's not analyzing it. It's not that's not what it's about. It's about making 500 mils of wine, tasting that and deciding is that is that what you want to achieve? Is that the the best balanced wine? Okay. All right. Thank you. Great. Okay, I've got uh, Sinead Sinclair from the Balalaika up in Johannesburg. Hello, Sinead. Hello, how are you? Hi, hey, Sinead. Um, well, I just wanted to find out, because I know you said you get your grapes from um, different regions, but are there any grapes that you guys grow on your own? Um, technically, no. Uh, how it works is uh, Fleur de Cup, per se, does not own a farm or does not have vineyards. So all our vineyards are contracted in from outside producers. So um, we've, these guys have been working for us, uh, with us for the past, uh, well, since we started, uh, 1968. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of those uh, grape growers go back to 1968. And we've, it's still their farm, still their grapes. We just buy it and based on quality, we will keep on buying those grapes. So um, obviously if they slack down, they will be worked out. We will, we will stop buying from them um, or, it, but, these guys are so proud and so so passionate about Fleur de Cup that we just keep on buying from them, and in the same same sort of. But nothing stops us from finding new producers. Like the, the one we have in in Ceres is um, goes back probably now only five years that we've started for four or five years that ago that we started buying from from a farmer in Ceres. Um, so we keep on we keep on going out and looking for for new vineyards, um, and at the same time not neglecting our core range of uh, core uh, producers that we buy grapes from. That was a good question, Sinead. Thank you, um, Devika Giga from Charge, Cape Town. Yes. Hi. How are you? I'm good. good what good. was it? Was it coffee in that that mug? It was. Your coffee. <laughs> Your coffee. <laughs> okay, I'm happy. So I wanted to ask, um, which, what do you find the hardest part of the harvest? And which grapes do you find the most difficult to work with? Ooh, hard, hardest part of the vintage is very easy. It is the lack of time spent with my family. <laughs> Because it's really, it's long hours. You absolutely, it's weekends. It is nonstop. Grapes do not have a weekend. They, they don't take time off. The cellar, we run a day and night shift. Obviously, I'm, I'm based in the, I'll try and stick to the day. Um, but I probably don't go home before eight o'clock at night. Um, I'm here Saturdays. I'm here Sundays tasting grapes, tasting wine, or not tasting grapes, tasting wines, fermenting wines. We, we only take in grapes Monday to Friday. But again, we, we, we keep on processing over, over the weekends. And um, so it's, it's long hours. And I always laugh that at night when I rock up at home, my, my kids don't really recognize me because they probably, or they don't almost see me because they've probably gone to bed. So maybe a little bit of time on a Saturday I get to spend on, with them. So that's the most difficult part of harvest season. It's long hours and, and, and I miss my family. But they do realize the, the, the importance of harvest because you, you only have that, that Two month window. That's it. No, no else. Um, most difficult grape is um, <laughs> pinotage um, for the fact that 
I, I spoke about the, sorry, yeah, uh, pinotage starts fermenting very quickly. It's just inherently to, to pinotage. And um, so when we add the yeast, it, there's almost no lag phase. It immediately just starts fermenting. And I prefer to stop my pinotage fermentation before it's, uh, not stop, the, sorry, not stop the fermentation, um, get it off the skins before fermentation is done. And to get that right means you, you keep on tasting as it's fermenting, might be two or three days, but it really might happen that the perfect point to take it off is at is during somewhere during the night. You 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 just might not you, you don't know when that point is. So I I have tasted it seven eight o'clock at night when I came in, uh, sort of when I, before I left and decided it's not ready to to press yet. And then I came back at three o'clock in the morning, tasted again and decided this is it. So I gave my night shift guys the, the, the instruction to start pressing. So it is just to sort of, the, you again, talk about two month window. Now you've got a four, five hour window where you need to press those grapes, get it off the skins so that it, it um, ferments dry in the tank, but without the skins. So for me, that, that makes pinotage very challenging because if you over extract out of the skins, it tends to go a bit dry and, and almost your old school pinotages over extracted and, and sort of you, you start getting that duco, that almost painty character on a pinotage that, uh, that I think a lot of people started, that's, it's very old school on pinotage and people didn't like that or there was a, there's a small amount of people that actually do like that weird character. I personally hate it, and therefore the way we manage to salvage or save pinotage is by getting it off the skins. And for me, it, it get that smack point where you stop fermentation, or not sorry, get it off the skins is very difficult to get it right. That's a good question, Vivica. Well done. Fatuma from Suns and Cape Sun. Okay, uh, my question is I've heard uh, you speaking about how. Uh, you are inspired by the fact that uh, over 80 countries enjoy your wine. Uh, what would you say is your greatest achievement on winemaking uh, from now that you are in the Cup uh, and before when you were still not in the Cup yet? Okay, so gr greatest achievement Hello? on yes. the Cup. Yes, and, uh, in, 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 in your overall yeah. wine making experience, what would you say is your greatest achievement? <laughs> okay, uh, personally, uh, managing to, to convince my wife to marry me, that was that, uh, still don't know how I managed that. Um, but um, just sort of uh, when I asked her dad, for her hand in marriage, if I could marry his daughter, um, I did promise him wine. Now, I know, sorry, I know in the black culture, Lubola is very much alive and well. Now, for me, I am still paying, after 15, 16 years of marriage, I am still paying him in wine. So, but, um, so I, that's how I got him to say yes, but how I got her to say yes, I still don't know. Um, so that was my biggest achievement on a birth. And then my two kids, they are absolutely the love of my life. And I, I am so proud of, of them and what they've achieved. And, but it's all my wife's hand in, in um, guiding them and everything. So yeah, my wife and my kids are by far my personal uh, biggest achievements. Uh, for Fleur de Cup, oh, there's, there's so many highlights, but um, yeah, we were the first seller in South Africa to achieve seven consecutive five-star ratings for a single wine. Uh, so for our Noble Eight Harvest, we managed to get a five-star platter rating in 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. No other winery has done that in the history of South Africa and, and since, I believe. 
So seven years in a row that our Fleur de Cup Noble Eight Harvest was judged to be a five-star quality in the Plateau magazine. That is just unbelievable. Um, I, I was involved in, uh, obviously I didn't do the 2006, but the, the from seven on was, was, I had a hand in them. Now, always, we, we, the grapes we get from our producers are of an exceptional quality. The team I work with is just absolutely dedicated, passionate people. So if I can never ever take the full, um, not not um, full uh, credit, thank you, for making these wines. But I I had a hand in them and. But it's, it's, it's an absolute honor to get seven five stars in a row. So that was a big achievement for us. Um, we were uh, top producer at Veritas in 2008. We, that was a, a very big thing for us. Um, to, uh, last year, or, yeah, last year we made top Sauvignon Blanc in South Africa, according to Michael, uh, uh, yeah, Michael Angelo International Wine Awards. So there's, we've managed two absolute top 10 pinotages. We've managed the top 10 Chenin Blanc, uh, top 10 Cabernet. Um, our Chardonnay got double gold. Uh, our Laszlo got double gold last year at Veritas. So all of these small achievements build on one another and it, it makes me immensely proud to be a Fleur de Cup winemaker. So I picked up that you studied winemaking. I just have one question on my side. What is the difference between Viti and Vini culture? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, Viti culture is, is the great of the um, vineyards itself. Um, so that is all about um, obviously establishing where you want to plant your next block of vineyards, the soil. Um, the slopes, everything to do with planting grapes and making sure that you get good, good quality grapes. Whereas uh, viniculture is the wine. So viti is the, the grapes, uh, yeah, the grapes and the, the vines. Where viniculture is the, the wine making part. So I studied uh, BSc viticulture and viniculture. So at the end of my four year study, I could potentially go into both directions. Um, a lot of seller, uh, a lot of wineries or sellers, whatever you want to call it, is um, the winemaker might focus a lot on both. Um, he is both the viticulturist and the winemaker. Um, whereas I'm in the very fortunate position of focusing more on the winemaking side, uh, because we do have a, a dedicated viticulturist for Fleur de Cup, who will liaise with those farmers that I just spoke about, or the, the producers. So uh, we have a, I have a link with those farmers. Although I do talk to them, I do go to the farms, but we've got somebody dedicated, focusing on the vineyards, so that I can focus on the wines in the cellar. Great, great. Uh, yeah, it's a full team that you've got to, got to run with uh, at the end of the day. Um, we've got Solomon Bander. Solomon was is with the Royal Assembly Waterfront and uh, equally brilliant uh, performance last year as a 2019 candidate. Um, Solomon, do you have a question then? No, at the moment. Uh, my apologies for the late uh, joining. Hey, uh, how are you? Connection. Remember? Good, how are you doing? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you, you so much. Glad to see you again. Later. So I want and to ask glad you. Glad to see a lot of new faces. Yes, a new face, <laughs> Solomon. It's so it's so wonderful to have you. And I'll get I'll get on to on to Lovejoy Nishamba from Element House, who was our Distel Into Hotel Challenge Wine Shoot of the Year of 2019. Remember. <laughs> and um, hey. I, I, quickly, quickly, before we get on to Lovejoy, um, are you based at um, when you make the Florida Cup wines? Are you based at the Bergelder or are you based at the Niederberg Distillery? You know the uh, wine making area. Winery. 
little bit of a complicated scenario. So, okay, yes, I'm, I'm, I, I, in the, for full disclosure, just as, as a background, obviously, yes, Fleur de Cup started back in 1968, um, based at the Bergkelder in Stellenbosch. Um, it was the brainchild of Dr. Anton Rupert, the, the famous Rupert family, um, where they, with, and uh, the name Fleur de Cap, or meaning flower of the Cape, um, was, they had a manor house in Somerset West and, or, and a little bit of a farm there, and they decided to call the entire brand Fleur de Cap. So that was the, the, the heart and the soul of Fleur de Cap based in Stellenbosch in the Bergkelder, where we managed to and, and age our beautiful vines in optimal conditions. Um, underground, literally built into the, the mountain at, at Bergkelder in Stellenbosch. Now, um, we obviously part of the bigger company called the Stell, like you know, and um, yeah, we are. Unfortunately, the Stell decided that um, they want to uh, consolidate um, a lot of their businesses, and uh, the idea was to move the entire Bergkelder, um, or the, the Berg, yeah, the Bergkelder uh, production facility uh, that had to close down. It's an extremely uh, popular part of Stellenbosch that um, has a very high property value and can be rezoned and and turned into something else. So unfortunately, they decided to close down the production facility at Bergkelder. And um, so, I mean, there's so many uh, things happening at the Bergkelder. It's not just Fleur de Cup. We produced a lot of other wine brands there as well. Um, including some of the some brandies were, were made the uh, interesting fact is amarula the the um, uh, marula fruit uh, fermentation took place at the Bergkelder a production facility that was moved to Houdini uh, they, they managed to sort of disperse the entire production that of, of a lot of things that happened at Bergkelder and one of the things was that they decided to pick up the entire Fleur de Cup production and move it to the Niederberg cellar. Um, but we literally took the tanks, the barrels, a lot of the pumps, the pipes, um, small uh, fermentation tubs, one and a half tub, ton tubs that, that, we, that we used for Fleur de Cup production. All of that equipment was literally picked up and put down in the heart of Niederberg. Um, so that, so literally my, the tools that I use to make Bergkeller hasn't changed, uh, sorry, Fleur de Cup hasn't changed. The, um, the producers that we buy our grapes from hasn't changed at all. We still buy this exactly the same grapes from the same producers. Um, and hopefully I am a bit of the continuity, the fact that I moved with the brand to, to Niederberg. So I'm based, I'm sitting literally at Niederberg now. Um, still responsible for making Fleur de Cup wines. So don't, don't, um, what I, don't mix the two brands. It's, it's a totally standalone brand. Fleur de Cup made just uh, purely, it's a GPS coordinate made at, at Seller Niederberg. Okay. I got that. Absolutely. Long, ex Absolutely. Um, so Long explanation. <laughs> We've got our last five minutes and I'd love, uh, love Joy to, to have a question. Okay. Um, I don't have any question at the moment. No the, question. Um, <laughs> okay, love joy, no problem. Listen, um, I think we've got we've got everybody on that side. But uh, from our side, we just want to wish you all the best, especially with your new home. Thank you. And um, and 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 just want to ask you just quickly, what's the difference between unfiltered? I know we might run out of time. So no. We cut off. no, 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 no. I'll, I'll keep it short now. Yeah, just what's the difference between uh, your unfiltered range and your series uh, um, it's exactly the same uh, it was a purely marketing driven name change uh, the, the the series Privé is still unfiltered wines okay so it, it it from a winemaking perspective zero zero difference um, we literally it's the same production method it's it's the label that just changed so the idea behind the unfiltered wines just quickly for those who don't know is 
is the fact that I, I get all those parcels uh, from different areas. I keep them separate and I go and set the, the single base tank of Sauvignon Blanc. I keep, uh, that is the one. Um, and I will bottle that on its own. Uh, then I might, let's say it's Darling, then, then, then it's a Darling tank. I might, or one or two Darling tanks that, are, that we blend together, but that's it. And then all the other areas, or all the other tanks, uh, we might blend together, and that's the standard Fleur de Cup Sommel Blanc. So the unfiltered is a selection of the best tank of, that we have available in the cellar. Um, that's the first leg of the unfiltered range. And then the second leg is the fact that to clarify those wines, we don't put it through a filtration process. Um, we just let it settle down by uh, gravity and time. And that, so all your impurities or, or that, that everything that makes the wine hazy or, or, or unclear will settle to the bottom of the tank and you uh, carefully uh, rack the clean wine from that sediment straight to a bottling tank and that goes straight into the bottle. So zero filtration. It just ensures that you have all those beautiful flavors, all those beautiful palate attributes, everything that, that was in the wine in the beginning stays there. Because the filtration proce process tend to be very harsh on the wine and, and can, you can potentially lose a, a lot of uh, impact because it's going through that filtration process. So that was the thinking behind the unfiltered range. Uh, the, the production method is exactly the same. The Ceres Privé was just a name change. Okay. That's fantastic. Well, um, from our side, just thank you very much. Love to come and uh, visit you otherwise. Uh, um, so all the best. Um, thank you. Okay, do we have two minutes left? We do. Can I? Okay. Yes, um, you do. can still hear me. Okay. So. I want to just hopefully, and if I can find, come on, where is it? I'm going to sing you a little, uh, or do a little bit of a, a rap, okay? So, here we go. The fact that I'm making unfiltered wines, now I'm going unplugged. So, please bear with me. <laughs> now, this is a story all about how our lives got flipped turned upside down, and I'd like to take a minute, just sitting right here, I'll tell you how we became the victims of corona fear. In Western Cape, born and raised in the cellar where I spent most of my days. Tasting, impressing, fermenting all cool. The wines we make is enough to make you drool. When a coronavirus, who we were up to no good, started making trouble in our neighborhood. We got in one little fight and Cyril got a scare. He said, you're moving in with your family, you're not going anywhere. We begged and we egged day after day. He blocked my streets to alcohol, he said nay. 21 day lockdown because of COVID-19. This is like nothing we have ever seen. Then came extension. We thought he was mean when he slapped us with a plus 14. We smelled our wines and then it was clear. The aromas are fresh. This is definitely not beer. If anything, I could say, yeah, these wines rock. But I thought now, nah, forget it. Our country better unlock. I woke up in the night about quarter to three. I said to my wife in a dream, the future I could see. I looked at my country, we were finally there. A country united, fighting Corona scare. Thank you team, I really hope you have a beautiful day. All the best with lockdown and um, hope to see all of you in person soon. Very good, thank you, thank you Peter. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Peter. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>